Hey everybody, Michael Waddell here, and I'm super excited about y'all seeing this episode. I'm sitting down with my great, great friend, T-Bone Turner, and we've got so much to talk about. This is long overdue for us to have this conversation, so y'all be sure to check it out. There's a lot of cool things we're going to get off the bone. Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast, A Bone to Pick with Waddy or Michael Waddell, whichever one you want to call me. This podcast is brought to you by Bushnell, the official optics of Realtree. You know, it's hard to believe Bushnell is celebrating 25 years since the innovation of the hunting laser rangefinder. A Bone to Pick podcast is also brought to you by the fine people at Chevrolet, the Chevy Silverado Realtree edition, featuring authentic Realtree camo pattern accents and graphics. Chevy Silverado is the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. This podcast is also brought to you by the best camo patterns in the industry, Realtree. You know, I got my start with Realtree, and Realtree continues to keep me hidden. Also, this podcast of On the Pick is brought to you by BoneCollector.com, where you can get all your Bone Collector swag. All right, enough of who brought you this and that. It's time to get out this big old chunk of meat and get it off the bone. That's why we call it a Bone to Pick. Bone to Pick with the biggest bone of them all. I know. <laughs> I'm going to steal his line. T-Bone just said we sat down a, a bone to pick with the biggest bone of all. <laughs> but a good night, man. I can't believe that that it's, we've waited this long to sit down and talk. Obviously, I had a chance to sit down and talk with, with Nick and um, and a lot of different people. And, and, and now I'm sitting down talking to you. T-Bone has been a friend for a long time. And, man, dude, so many adventures, so many crazy stories, some things that we can't tell. Because we don't want to incriminate yeah. ourselves, we don't want to get quite in trouble. a few things to be honest with you. Yeah, quite I, a few things. Yeah. Honestly, I thought the podcast was going to be about like some of our turkey hunting episodes. Oh, that's right, I've never turkey hunted with you, so <laughs> I, I didn't think it was going to happen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that is funny. That's the one thing I've hunted with everybody. I've never actually been turkey hunting. With We've been in camp a lot together, but as far as like sitting back to back on a tree, I don't think it's ever happened. And uh, you know, each year we always talk about it. this year's going to be the year, and I'm like. At this point, you know, twenty something years in, I, I I don't want to break our streak. I I think I want to go to the grave, you know, not turkey hunting with Waddell. Not exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's almost become weird. Because, yeah. Because in one way, it's like we married, but it's almost like we we've been in all these adventures, crazy animals we've hunted, but we've never sat down and hunted turkey together, and we've been in camp together. So it's yeah. almost like being married to somebody, but you never never got a kiss from them. Almost. It's, yeah, it's always like a you know a, a brotherly type thing. It's something that you can always uh, you know, give you fits about it, you know, so, you know, I always want to hold that over your head, but you know, Hey, I, I'm, I totally understand. And you get pulled in a thousand different directions. Everybody wanting to turkey hunting with you every year. And, you know, you got so many kids and family members and you got this big, nice farm and everything like that. So, you know, I know where my rank is on the totem pole. So I'm way down there on the bottom. So maybe one year there might be 37 turkeys killed and I might get a chance to get in there. But uh, it might be some old limping Jake or something. Yeah. You're thinking you've done got me to where I'm, I'm trying to get my turkey population up on my place and I'm teasing you all year long. Hey, what come, hell? You yeah, exactly. Come turkey yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> it is funny. I swear in the world of greed where, where I always pick on our good friend, Nick Mutt, I've always said he's the sweetest nicest most humblest game hog probably that's ever lived <laughs> yeah i mean he is because he's but but and i'm and i don't consider myself a game hog but i am a turkey hog like yeah it's funny because i i do have like my wife loves to turkey hunt all my kids love to turkey hunt and and i will literally like hear three or four turkeys gobble and say on the farm and i'll get excited but then i think well, good night. If Christy wants to hunt one, yeah. And I'm thinking, man, I don't want to. And then I, I'll catch myself hoarding, almost like when you was a kid getting those big old, you know, box of Oreos or something. Yeah. And 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 scared that you know somebody's gonna find out your brother or sister is gonna jump in your Oreos and don't know it. I catch myself with turkeys that way. Yeah. And a lot of times I'll end up hoarding them up and won't even won't even hunt them. I'll end up not shooting them and nobody will. Yeah. Save some and, for and seed. It, and it makes me mad because you know I'm supposed to be this turkey killer, and it's not that I'm one of these guys that. Or just a diehard conservationist. I mean, I love it. Through mm -hmm. hunting, we've learned that you know we are conservationists, environmentalists, whatever you want to call it. But right. It is awkward, and it is you know I'm ashamed of that. I'm ashamed me and you ain't turkey hunted. I actually. Am. Oh no! We're don't gonna worry do it. about We're it. Gonna no, do no, it. no, that's fine, man. We, we, I've got so many memories with Waddell, and and man, I'm you know we was talking last night on the phone. You know, if I don't kill another cockroach, I've I've man, I've far outlived my dream. So I'm I'm totally fine with that. Man, we've shared so many good camps all across this country, and uh canada mexico and deer hunting camps I, I i'll give you the turkey hunting 
I want to do more deer hunting with you. There you go. We'll do that. <laughs> we'll do that. And and uh, it's funny, man. I was thinking about it the other day because I remember when we created Bone Collector, you know, years ago now. It's hard to believe because I feel like it just happened yesterday. I feel I like it. all of my career, I don't know if you feel this way, I feel like everything just started even though I've been doing it. Other than looking in the mirror and I'm like, man, wait a minute, that was me then? That's 2000 or 2001? And I know. Now it's 2022, so obviously a few more wrinkles, obviously a few more gray hair. Yeah. And it, but, but in reality, my mentality is still like a 12-year-old with We're it. still fresh. But it's amazing, man. I look back. It's like we're becoming now like the Rolling Stones of the hunting industry. Our band's been together a while, man. I know it. It sure has. And, and you know, I, I don't know if you call it seasons or uh, years or what have you, but, man, we're rolling up on, what, 14 years? 15 years. Yeah, 14, of, of 15 doing years. our shows. Just, just, just bone the bone collector, collector, not to Not counting road trips and, and archery shops. And, man, it, it, it goes, you know. The Monster Bucks videos. I know it. I mean, half the people probably watching this podcast or that in the podcast, you know, they, yeah. they don't know us before Bone Collector. I mean, I, I know we, you know, tell our stories on so many uh, different uh, radio shows and stuff that we do in the past. But, man, we got... 20 years under our belt before we even started uh, Bone oh, Collector. Oh, yeah. I, it's crazy. Yeah, but, people ask me all the time, like, well, where did you meet T-Bone? It's like, man, I don't remember the day meeting T-Bone. I just remember always knowing T-Bone, even yeah. before I knew him. Yep. And I think I think that was kind of mutual. The enigma. The, like, yeah, because, I mean, <laughs> it goes back and definitely you know definitely something for you to reflect on and like how we all got hooked up but my recollection recollection of, of this character called t-bone or really travis turner because yeah. t-bone did come about through the jeff foxworthy In realtor, and monster yeah. bucks and this character t-bone you you kind of developed or fox really helped develop yep. it when he was doing some trying to spice up monster bucks in that little archery tournament but i remember when i was a kid i worked at a place called big buck trading post which a guy named shane collier was a, a archery guy. None of us knew anything about archery. And then, then I'd always hear of of this guy named Travis Turner that up in Hogansville area had a really cool uh, shop that, that he was also, not only was he working and, and doing bow wrench and selling bows, but he also was a world champion. And, and so it was funny at that particular time, I didn't know you, I just knew of you. And it seemed like to me at that particular time frame, you had Shane Collier, down in Manchester, Georgia, who was setting up bows back in those days. Yeah. A lot of PSEs, a lot of high country. Browning was huge. Martin. Spoiler. Uh, yes. Yeah. Bill Pearson spoiler. Man. That, po yeah. And then, then you got into those mock flights. Um, Brown and, and then obviously Hoyt was around. Hoyt's yeah. been around forever. But, um, but nobody knew about, a lot about archery. And, it, and I felt like, it, 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 to my recollection, Travis Turner and Shane Collier what y'all didn't know when y'all opened your shop, you was learning on the fly, going to these ASA and IBO and shooting. And and back in those days, I remember the first bow I bought, which I was 11 or 12, I'd saved up my money, and I bought this Martin Pro Eliminator, was a, was a bow, and I didn't know anything about it. And it was 31-inch draw, and I think my dad decided to get me like 75, 80-pound limbs. I think that's so, the only draw and weight they made back then for anybody. Probably. <laughs> yeah, it was... I, yeah. Yeah. How I, I got an ear. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I remember, whether you're I, I five eight or six four. I remember shot a thirty one eighty. I remember literally like I was twelve, so I played football and baseball and you know raised by Papa Waddell, so yeah. I felt like I was pretty damn tough, you know, because my dad was always about physical and mental discipline. But I remember buying that bow and and like a couple days, three days after I had it, I never could fire an arrow. I couldn't pull the damn thing back. And like, I remember like getting choked up. Like, I just want to shoot this bow so bad. And I had a pin sight and I, you know, everybody come over to the yard and shoot. And I was like, oh, I was pulling it back. And I finally literally was got to where I could pull the sucker back and shoot it a few times. <laughs> yeah. And then the fire come on. But, um, but anyway, T-Bone, what I want to talk about too is when was it that, that you knew that, man, archery is not going to be my thing? Because obviously we all grew up similar. Good mom and dad, you know, raised up. Yeah. You know, we, we were Gen X. But when did you figure out that's like this archery thing is this is something that's turning my crank? Yeah, I, I never was good at you know in sports. I played sports, you know, I played recreational basketball, played a little baseball, and played football. And you know, I I, I never was that good. I was just a big guy on the line. I I got me a uh, 
I, my whole determination in high school football was to play enough to get me a letterman, a letterman's jacket. That's right. To impress the chicks. Have the chicks. Oh, I mean, dude. that's it. And then I quit because, hey, that's taking up too much hunting and fishing in fall time. Got my letter jacket. Done. I got my letterman jacket. I'm done. And they said, don't you want to play? And I'm like, man, I ain't even close to going to no college or anything like that. I'm done of getting beat up. You know, I mean, I like football, but I liked hunting and fishing a whole lot better. So, um, you know, I never was really that good at anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, swimming wise, I float pretty good. So I, <laughs> I, guess, uh, I swim pretty good. But out of high school, just right out of high school, I hunted. I now, what hunted years it. are this? What years are these? It's like I 80. Said. I graduated 86. So this is like okay. uh, 80. You know, I hunted since I was four or five. But right. It was always with a gun. It was squirrel hunting and, you know, a little bit of deer hunting, rabbit hunting, you know, quail hunting, doing all that kind of thing with my dad. So in 86, I graduated. Well, right out of high school, um, you know, I'm hanging out with my buddies. We're fishing. We're hunting. I get into a hunting club. You know, I scratch together some nickels. You know how you pay yeah. $300 yeah. to go to a uh, hunting club that, you know, uh, timber land. So I, I'm, I'm into this hunting club, and they're, they're all starting to shoot their bows in the summertime. And I'm like, I had a bow when I was a kid. My dad had bought it for me, and, you know, I but got was it. was probably like an old? Just an old recurve. Yeah. I still got the thing, just flinging arrows and. Yeah, you know, and I shot it, and I'd hit my arm, and it was it was really just like you said, it was too many pounds. It was a forty five pound, and I was ten years old, and I couldn't hardly bend the string yeah. much. So I, right. I got a bad taste in my mouth about my first uh, archery archery experience. that I had. So I was against it. And then you read all these things about people wounding deer, and that's my mentality of archery going through um, high school. So when I got out, my buddies in the summertime. They were starting to shoot in the backyard. They were quitting fishing. This was June or July, and they're getting ready for archery season. They said, "Won't you get your bow?" I said, "We're probably not going to be fishing anymore. You ought to come shoot with us." And I'm like, "Nah, nah, I ain't going to do yeah. that. I'll just wait till gun season." Well, anyway, they talked me into it. We go and buy my buy the bow on a Wednesday, and uh, while we're at the store, the guy that owns the local archery range was was there and talked to my buddies about coming out to the tournament that they were having that Sunday, five days later. And I'm not really paying much attention. I'm sitting there nervous. Is this in the Atlanta area? Or this just... is at uh, Gable Sporting Goods in Douglasville. Yes, I, I know, I know yeah. where Gable. I called yep. the contest up there. Yep. Yeah, and they're still actually open today. You know, Gable's um, a great so, store. Yep. Um, Bobby Smith actually yep. sold me my first bow. So I'm getting it set up. He took an 80-pound bow, backed it down to 64 pounds. I wouldn't pull it back in the store because I was thinking, I can't pull this bow. Cause yeah. My mentality was at 10 years old, I couldn't pull 45. But, you know... You know, I'm, I'm bench pressing 265 pounds and, you know, I'm a lot bigger guy and, you know, playing football and stuff like that. I, in hindsight, I knew I could pull it, but I didn't want to pull it. I didn't want to get embarrassed in front of all my buddies in the store. Right. So I'm like, well, I've just paid $400 for this bow set up. I'm taking it home. I ain't <laughs> pulled the bow back one time yet. It's set on 64 pounds. I got to see if I can pull this back. So uh, it's on a Wednesday. I'm upstairs in my room still living at home with my mom. And uh, I go, oh, here we go, one, two, three, I'm fixing to pull this thing, and I about ripped the wheels off of it. So, so you snatched it back, no problem. Oh, no problem, no problem. But but in my head, I was still the 10-year-old kid that couldn't pull 45 pounds. 45-pound recurve, yeah. So instantly, I just was like, oh, man, I might be able to I'm do gonna, this. Yeah. Didn't know how I would do as far as, you know, hand-eye coordination. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, just shot like, you know, every free time after we got off work, we shot till dark over at my buddy's house, and I was doing pretty good. I only had six errors, and they said, are you going to go to the tournament with us tomorrow? And I'm like, man, I've had on this bow for four days. I'm not going to no tournament. Well, come on. We ain't never shot no tournament. So six of us went. They had never shot a tournament. We show up over there. We sign up in the novice division, the beginner yeah. division. We go out through the woods, and, and I just absolutely loved it. It was a, I, it shows my age, but it was a 2D. This was before 3D targets. This was paper targets with the pencil line yes. around the vitals. You remember that? I remember that. Shooting I into do. Excelsior bells, which is what they stuff in around um, coffins. We'd get the Excelsior bells from Bates Casket Company up in North Carolina, and that's what we'd shoot into. Basically like the insulation almost. You just the wooden insulation so yeah. that when the you know the, the coffin rots, it rots too. It's, it's yeah. all organic, naturally rotten. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, we go shoot 20 targets, and, and I was happy because I didn't lose no arrows, and I was... Uh, shooting with my buddies and i actually outshot them so i was i'm absolutely super pumped about uh uh beating them you know i'm like well i, I, I beat these guys and i'm like i've only owned a bow for four days well, right 37 people in the class and and i i ended up being the top dog i mean owned a bow for four or five days and i'm like man i might have found something i'm pretty decent at so yeah 
whether it was luck that first day or not, it just made me want to just shoot all the time. So I shot all the time, and every time they had a tournament, I would I would turn up. I killed my first deer with a, a bow that year. I actually killed three deer that year, and from that point on, you know, we're Do you talking. remember, what was that first bow? Do you remember that first bow you ever bought? Oh, absolutely. The first bow was a uh, Strata Flight Express, PSC Strata Flight Express. How about that? And then, you know, back then they were breaking limbs left and right. And then uh, I upgraded to a Thunder Flight Express. And then I think I really went big time and I got me one of those uh, Cougar Speed Flight Magnums, the Martin. Ooh. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, you know, and back then we was all shooting high poundage, yeah. 80 pounds, 90 pounds. If you could pull it, you were shooting it. That's right. Way too long a draw length. But yeah, um, that was in 88. I won my first state championship in 90. Um, I was asked to be on the Browning Manufacturers team and sh started shooting professionally and um, had, you know, everything I've competed in since then has always been the professional division. And then in 91, I got real lucky and won the world championship. So, yeah, I mean, I ain't too good, but at two things is, uh, well, three things, eating Cheetos, <laughs> floating and swimming and uh, shooting a bow. So <laughs> even all these years later, I just can't get enough of it. You know how you was talking about earlier, uh, you know, just we were sponges, you know, Shane and I, or anybody that's working yeah. in a shop. I mean, I feel like I still feel that way. I just, just can't get enough of being in the shop and building a better mouse trap and just, you know, everything about archery is like taking the best of golf because you're suppressing nervous energy and then NASCAR to where you have to tweak your, tech it your out. bow and tech it out and, you know, always stay up on uh, the, the, the workings of the bow and the, um, the, the tunability of it so that it's forgiven. But then, then you have to ha have your own shootability and suppress your nervous energy. You just combine and golf and golf and NASCAR. That's really what it is. It, it is. It is. You, I mean, you got to work on it, then you got to drive it. Exactly. And then you, you know, just like reloading bullets, you know, like if I put two grains more powder in here, if I put a little more FOC here, if I put a little more twist in this area, if I tuned and, uh, you know, jacked my rest to the left, if I leveled my sight, you know, all these things are splitting hairs and, you know, tightening your groups. You know, it's like no matter how good you are or how good you tune, you can always get better. So it's like yeah. you're you're never satisfied. So you know, working in the archery dungeon slash dojo down there, trying to build better mouse traps in the yeah. laboratory, and, and helping folks, you know, um, just just setting people's bow up and seeing how accurate they can be so quick has always been a joy of mine and a passion of mine. And you know, when we built our house, Michelle said, "You know, why are you putting an archery shop in the basement?" I'm like. Till the day I die, I'm going to be working on archery. I mean, even if I dip septic tanks for a living, I'm still going to be You're working on bows on the pillow. side. I just yeah. love it that much. Well, it's amazing. I mean, what what also is said there too, which one thing you're unbelievable out is your humility, because you said I got lucky in '91 and won the world championship. I I don't I don't believe that. One thing I've always thought about archery competition, it is kind of this solitary sport of competition where you know i grew up playing baseball football and i love team sports but you're isolated you know and yeah. even and even my first opportunity to do something isolated was turkey calling yep and 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 i can say that i got lucky to say to win some championships but the reason i can say lucky even though i was solitary i had a judge that had to judge it archery there's no way in hell you got lucky. You just beat the rest of the people now you might have feel like you were lucky but that's your humility so it's amazing that you know, most people come in and like, won't even say, you know, throw luck in that. And so that's one reason yeah. that, that I've always just really respected you because no matter what happens, it's like there's this gratefulness and this humility that oh, comes yeah. with it. But in reality, you spent hours and hours and hours perfecting this craft, not only in the wrenching, but the physical aspect of trying to figure out and become a better archer and shooting. Because yeah. like you're talking about, you can wrench on this stuff all day and have it tuned per precisely and know that you're tearing a good hole and know that it's capable of doing this stuff. But then you can question it if you're having an off day out there and you're shooting on the range and you just said, I put it down. Maybe I had too much coffee or maybe the wind's blowing and like the Will yeah. Ferrell, the, 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 the ambience acoustics in this room. Or, I mean, so you have to put it back down and come back and keep trying to master the wrenching versus the physical capability of just sitting out there and shooting it and understanding the mechanics of it. Oh, so there's a lot that goes into archery. Absolutely. I mean, the like you said, the mechanics are a lot of it and trying to build a more forgiving and a more accurate uh, system. And you always wonder, you know, you're scratching your head if you could do it. But, uh, you know, I believe most of it is mental. You know, you get inside your own head and, man, you can stub your toe real, <laughs> real quick yeah. just from what you're thinking and how you're holding and, you know, if, if people 
honestly, if people would spend half as much time on themselves, training themselves as what they do on trying to build a better setup, you can take a crappy setup, but if you're more like a machine and you work on yourself, you'd be a lot more accurate, but you know, we, so the mental aspect is yeah, strong. mental and physical, you know, you want to be machine like you want to have muscle memory and make sure that you are repeatability. So, you know, if it, we can take a bow that is tuned crappy, I mean, where the air is flying down there sideways, you put it on a shooting machine and it'll hit the same hole every time, even though it's yeah. quite flying crappy, but you take that same bow that is tuned terribly and put it in the, a, a man's hand between the middle, the, the not being a machine like, and not having good muscle memory. And then plus, between his ears and he can't hit the broadside of the barn with it. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, that, that there's a huge, you know, you, you need to humble yourself and make sure that you work on yourself as much as you do your equipment. So, um, th there is a, a lot to be said for the mental aspect of it. I, cause do you think that's, a, do you think overall, <laughs> do you think that's a, that's simple or, or, or very complicated? Or do you think that sometimes people try to overanalyze or over complicate maybe shooting bows or, where, where do you think that simplicity? Well, it depends on your personality, I think so. But uh, I think a lot of people just want to, out of the convenience, want to buy accuracy. They, they just want to spend money on it. They want mm -hmm. to spend a little time rather than pointing the finger at themselves saying, I don't shoot that good. They're like, I need to do this. If I buy this site, I'm going to hit better. Whereas mm -hmm. fact of the matter is if you got a toothpick on there, you know, if you're, if you shoot like a machine, you can aim with a toothpick, but people don't want to do that. They want to, they want to try to buy accuracy and buy more forgiveness. And, which is nothing wrong with that by no means, you know, because you got to have great equipment. And then if you got confidence in your equipment, then you will shoot a little better. But fact of the matter is we need to turn the magnifying glass on ourselves and work Very more true. on ourselves. Yeah. I mean, we're all guilty yeah. of it. I'm guilty of it too. It's like, you know what I mean? I need to get out there and shoot 20, 20 arrows today, but now, nah, you know what I think I'm going to do, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to tweak on this rest and see if I can build some forgiveness and that way I can skip the, the shooting part of it. So true, you, you know that, and a lot of people do that. But uh, so maybe try to trying to manufacture or buy security when in reality the yeah. security is always within yourself. Whether you got a toothpick for a pen, or you got the most expensive, you know, dead ringer bone collector sight that money could buy. Yeah, to 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 move to 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 make this longer shot. But in reality, if this toothpick is sitting there and it's a hundred yard toothpick, yeah, if you spend even if it's spent, even if it's kicking a little bit coming out at rest. You can, if you're a shoot machine like, and you got this yeah. up here, you can do that. But then if you can take what you know that there's a kick and air or yep. two pick and have a better fiber optic pin and a movable sight possibly, now you possibly can start getting to that Levi Morgan type of That's mindset. right. If, you, if you've got the mental confidence and then you've spent enough time behind that bow to where it's, you are one with the bow, uh, you, you can overcome what you think that you don't have in equipment. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can be machine like. So that you're doing the same things every time. The guy that only picks his bow up two weeks before season, he's not doing the same things twice. However, equipment and innovations are so good and so forgiving that it shows it, it doesn't show up as bad as it did, you know, 20 years ago. But if you put that together, if you have a, you know, really work on your mental game, really work on your muscle memory and work on your shot and your form and you're confident, you know, you know, I mean, you're one of the most confident shooters there are. If if you work on that confidence you're going to be a way better archer than what your equipment is. You see what I'm saying? I do. But, I do but it's see, nice see, to have yeah. the forgiveness of the equipment and you put the two together and, and that's when you get, you know, someone like your Levi Morgan. Well, that is funny you say that because I think about the Levi Morgan and I think about even my relationship with you early on. And even when we started doing, you know, bone collector, I, there's no doubt um, my, friendship and relationship with you especially with me and nick and really everybody yeah. that you're surrounded um because i can i can name drop on this when i think about people like you know blake shelton um you know constantly you know uh, you know a lot of bows you'd set up and we'd send to blake well blake just a minute, man i'm shooting this bow so good zach brown who i was talking to the other day yep um completely just has so much confidence knowing to spend a little time you know, with you working on his bows and talking through him. And he's a very accomplished archer himself. And so a lot of these guys that sing and play guitars, I mean, there's there's all kind of personality and celebrities. My wife, who had never shot a bow, and here I am, a, a, a you know, I consider myself somewhat an archery guy, but I'm not at the same level of wrenching and patience. She, anytime somebody asks, she can get out there in the yard, you know, 20 to 60 yards or 50 yards for sure. And she will just about shoot with anybody, and she has not even shot the bow 
at all. And somebody say, how are you? Do you practice all that? Nope, nope. No one on team won't talk me how. And, and and I find that amazing. And it Christy's goes so my like, biggest cheerleader. She is. She, <laughs> she, 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 I mean, it's funny. She will only turkey hunt with me or Philip Culpepper, and she will not hardly shoot a bow unless T-Bone has touched it. Yeah. And, and if you were to tell her anything different than what you taught her probably 15, 16 years ago, yeah. she, she just like, Nope, this works, and T Bone showed me this, and this is how you draw. This is how you anchor. This is how you pull back a bow, and and he told me to do this, and and it's funny. I, I can say, well, why don't you try? Nope. I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, T Bone told me this, and so um, it's amazing. I think that's sometimes not conveyed enough in what we do, because if you watch Bone Collector, I mean, we're goofing off, having fun, trying to make some good yeah. piles, but in reality, it, it does kind of. If I ever get offended let's just say by the trolls i sometimes probably will get offended more if somebody says something negative about you or nick than i do me i feel the same way because because i'm like man you know there's a lot of people at the time that we did bone collector that i could have picked but i picked not only people that i liked and just enjoy that time around so if we're gonna make music together well i want to after the music's made sit around and yeah whether it's a glass of sweet tea or a cold beverage uh, of choice you know i want to be able to shoot the crap about family and life and yeah and, and have some agreements on things but you know i look back i you you were accomplished you were a world champion you knew you knew your game when it comes to this aspect of archery the technicality of it you'd work with different manufacturers at that particular time we were all shooting a hoyt bow at this particular time based on choice and opportunity and we we loved it but at the same time i you know i look at you as what you were doing in the archer world and being a true retailer to where you had a dealer in a pro shop yeah. you're selling bows working on not just one brand all the brands you're selling all the broadheads selling all the arrows you're, you're looking at all kind of different technicalities whether back in the day in the 80s when you had the overdraw and everybody oh, yeah. was shooting the lightest little arrow aluminum shaft you could shoot heavy pounds long draws. you really couldn't be effective unless you're shooting 100 pounds and a freaking 20 inch arrow yeah, i right. mean crossbow bolt essentially oh my or, le or lighter so way yeah. lighter and um you know we were shooting 125 145 grain heads and then we saw the conception of the mechanical heads yep. and we saw those first and those uh was it the pocket remember those ones that come out i remember those of uh, the blood trailer the blood trailers Bucket blood trailers i mean i remember seeing thunder the thunderheads that you know even muzzy when they hit the scene all the way to now working with g5 and, and shooting you know these broadheads now that from a technicality standpoint like I, it this is past the threshold of of unbelievable to me for yeah. the blood trails and the, and whether you're shooting an elk or a moose or a whitetail those mega meats and those rear deploying yeah. broadheads I'm like unbelievable at the technology, but you wonder where the innovations are going to take. Yeah, you, you wonder, and 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 I remember always having you as a mentor and a friend there. And so when we started Bone Collector, then you had Nick. He was a Western big game guy. I mean, Nick Nick was always a student of these things. So when I ever see a negative comment like, "Well, these just paid TV hunters," I, I think where I got offended was the fact that, and if I say it loud and clear in this this particular you know podcast, is that you know, not not that we're any different. We're not any different than anybody else. But we we can say all of us three invested our whole life in this space. Yep. And if it wouldn't be for this space, we would probably be down there on a street corner, possibly. I mean, that that that's probably a no no. Push, but we we would we might be working construction, doing heating and air. But our life was given to this passion of archery hunting. We chose that though. We chose it's it. It's our it, it, all three of us have different stories, but yet they're the same story. It's the same Me story, like, but different. Yeah, we cashed in early on. Early on, we yeah. we we went in for our passion, and, and and even to this day, I mean, you know, as we get older, it seems like you get a little wiser, and you you know, folks are like, you know, so many people don't realize, you know, like we all started in the early nineties or or you know late eighties or 80s, early nineties, yeah. uh, you know, something in there, and and we all had other careers beforehand, but you know what, while we didn't have responsibilities we cashed in on our uh, I, I shouldn't say our passion but now that don't mean it was just like th there's a lot of humble beginnings i mean like when i had that store in hogansville i moved i was driving 61 miles one way to come to the store and i'm not i'm just saying me you went through the same thing as well as so did nick but like i mean there was a lot of beanie weenies eat there was yeah. a lot of venus sausages i'm talking about that cash register sometimes in the slow time of year would only get 150 dollars in it for the whole week yeah for the week and i'm like i'm making sixteen thousand dollars a year uh running a store 
working sometimes 80 hours a week, especially during the peak times. But I was happier as a uh, as a jackass eating briars. I mean, I, yeah. honestly, I couldn't think of anything else. Like you just absolutely couldn't get more of it because you were so passionate about it. You enjoyed it. It's like you know what? The money will come. The money will come as long as my bills are paid and as long as I ain't got to close the doors. You look forward to going to that shop. I look forward to going to it. It wasn't like I, I dreaded like oh man, yeah. I, I I got to got to help people be better at archery and live their bow hunting dreams. And then getting hooked up with Realtree and you guys when you was working for Realtree and you know you was a you you know you was taking people hunting but you know what you was doing something that you loved, loved and it. you was getting a, a paycheck for it. I mean there was a lot of I mean ten years I was like I got to stop this I got to go be a fireman I, I yep. got a two year degree as a heat and air I mean you probably thought about that too It's like man what am I doing All right I've played around for eight years now with archery It's time to get serious about life You know. You know, I got to get a house. I got to do this. I got to be responsible. But, you know, we just kept our nose to the grindstone. And then you don't feel like you worked a day in your life. And then, you know, finally doors are opening and opportunities are coming there. And, you know, here we are now. I'm so proud of me, you, and Nick. And there's a lot of other people in the industry that are this way too that are humble and stuff like that. But, you know, me and you always tell the story that you and I have this talk probably once or twice a year about plan B. It's like, yeah. You know, we're real successful, and odds are we're probably going to do something in the outdoor industry from now on. However, yep. we have that mentality. It's like, man, you know what? Daddy could still probably build a house, and I, I, I still remember a little bit. I still got my manifold gauges. I probably still work on heating and air. And, <laughs> That's right. You know, I mean, I got, I got a little money set aside. I can get a van, a service van, and, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, like, somebody will hire me to Fletch Airs. Surely yeah. I can get a job at, like, a – an outdoor store and an academy or something like that. Surely I'll be able to get a job. I think that still, and I and you know a lot of people laugh when we tell them that, but I think it's good that we have that. You know, it's because it shows where our roots are, and it shows that we come from humble beginnings, and it shows that we're appreciative of yeah. what this industry and what our our passion and and life has given us. But that is anyway. amazing, man. It's it's actually that's very deep. Yeah, it's very deep, and and, and it, I think it does go back to our raising and and our appreciation yeah. of what we get a chance to do, and and for me, that's why I love talking about it. And you know, you and I both, um, anytime that we do anything on Instagram or we do anything on social media on our shows, I mean, I'll always say, "Man, love y'all." You say that, and and you know what? It, it's not just something cool to say because I really do. Because I in do my too. mind, I know that I'm talking to people that that are very much every bit as capable as me at, at the sport of hunting. If you want to call it a sport, other life. So. It's, it, yeah, if not more so. Yeah. I mean, I've been around the country. I've done seminars and spoke on the topic, you know, and you have on bows and archery. And now, you know, most of the time if you go hear Nick, T-Bone, and Waddell speak or us individually, it's mostly just story time. It's almost yeah. a comedy act because I, I don't feel like an expert. In reality, I'll look back and I'll speak with my guys, uh, you know, Ryan Wakenick and Cohen and the guy, Cohen Stone and, and Jackson, you know, all these, you know, we got a small company and we'll, we'll sit in there and talk and sometimes I'll pick their brain, they'll pick mine. And then I'll realize after conversations like, wow, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, I take for granted some of the things that I've been taught that I've learned, whether yeah. it's breasting out a turkey or whether it is the penetration of an arrow and will this light arrow work versus if you want to get into the heavier debates, it's like, yeah, I do think that one's better. Now, this one will work. And, and if you ask me how I know, it's I know because I got 10 of them broke off and dead animals. It, that exactly. deer there was killed with an arrow that said wouldn't work. It that was my first Pope and Young. You know what I'm saying? It ain't on paper. It ain't on paper. It's, it's not a formula. It's just I didn't know any better. Yeah. But, but overall, I think the humility, if you ask me one thing of why I really like our relationship together, I think our humility is beyond what people realize. However... You won't find three more confident people. I mean, yeah. like if, like prime example, if it, it, I've, we've done it a million times, and I'll, I'll brag on this on T Bone. So across our span of our career, especially since road trips and, and Bone Collector, and uh, Tyler and Brian Brown are doing the road trips thing, so we're not part of that other than just cheerleading what their guys are doing. But I remember in the early stages of road trips that led on into Bone Collector, sometimes we'd go to a place, and it might be might be a little turkey calling contest. And what I loved about it is like, pff, Nick, Nick and T-Bone, like, what else got this? He'll win. Yeah. Or then we'd get to a deal where it'd be some little, they'd call it a celebrity archery shoot. Maybe it was the yeah. Drury's Lakoski. And I remember thinking, T-Bone's going to kill these mm-hmm. guys. And I remember, I remember one time Jeff Danker and, and uh, 
Matt Duff and, and all those guys we was at Harrisburg or, or maybe it was Kansas or somewhere. Is it a show? I think it was Kansas and, and, and Duff and I don't, Chipper might've been there. I'm not sure. I know Duff was and dude, they had been shooting cause me and you had not even prepared. I mean like we, we just showed up. They said, bring your bow, make no mistake. These are promoters that were paying all of us to be there to, to hang out with right. the people and the consumers. And I never forget. So this is where I'm talking about the humility meets confidence. I never forget. I walked up and Matt and we're all friends and kind of high five and give an old man hug and Danker and all these guys around. <laughs> There's two or three other personalities. I want to. Say, I don't know if Pat was there, but there was a bunch of hunting personalities that had shows on Outdoor Channel. And um, so anyway, come up and uh, and somebody said, "Dude, he's been uh, that guy over here on Major League Bowhunter has been really been practicing. It. He he he's you know he he wants to win this thing." And, and without hesitation, so I'm talking about humility, call it cockiness. I said, no, he won't win. T-Bone's here. And, um, <laughs> and they looked at me like, how would you say it? I said, well, matter of fact, me and T-Bone here. So y'all might get third. And dude, I remember forget we had not. I said, T-Bone, you've been shooting your bow? And he said, no, not really. I hadn't. It don't sound like humility to It me. don't sound like humility. <laughs> but in reality, I'm humbled to be there amongst yeah. this. But all of a sudden, now it's the Tom Brady. We walk into this room, it's like, wait a minute, it's just for fun. It's just for entertainment. Like that old movie over it's the just, top. It's just, you know, you got a couple hundred people backwards. watching to see, you know, and they're watching not to see if T-Bone's going to beat Waddell or Waddell's going to beat Matt Duff or, or Jeff Danker or Pat Nicole. They, they just were just looking like, okay, I think their biggest thing, and, and, and somebody can comment if they're hearing this, I think the biggest thing was like, okay, let's just see if these guys can shoot. I'm watching them. There's yeah. no editor involved. This is live. Yeah. They got to shoot an arrow at this 70 yard target or 40 yard target. They got to figure out if this is 30. I think it was a pop up or something. I can't remember exactly what we're shooting at. But I remember thinking immediately, I'm walking back in, like, okay, if you're walking in IBOA, say you're measuring up the competition. Oh, God, Olmer's here. Yeah. Oh, my God, freaking the, uh, okay, I got to bring it today. You know, you yeah. know, I remember walking in the turkey calling contest and I could quickly survey the room. I was like, I can beat everybody here. Oh, my God, Chris Kirby and Chris Parrish. Walter Parrott just come in. He barely met the deadline, just paid his entry fee. And Ricky Joe Bishop's here. I yeah. got some work to do. Gonna be a tough but if day. I look in the room like, oh, my God, $1,000 first prize, like, looking good. And yeah. I'd be like, oh, so, like, I'm going to beat everybody. And then there's Joe Drake and there's Salter. Like, Salter, ain't you retired? What are you doing here? <laughs> but here I'm looking around. I'm like, T-Bone's -bon, T going to beat all these guys. So, yeah, maybe it don't sound yeah. like humility. But that confidence, and sure enough, that particular time, remember we got done, remember you won, and I got sacked it, and I said, like, sorry guys, maybe they won't book us next year. Yeah, it's like, whew, yeah, exactly. Out that time. And so many that time. times that th there's that confidence. So with the humility comes an undeniable confidence. You know, yeah. it's like if, if there's a turkey goblin, I'm thinking, if he's goblin, if he keeps goblin, I'm not going to get close. We're not going to have this experience of seeing a squirrel run across a tree and maybe we see the bumblebees pollinate. It's like, no, we're about to murder a turkey. Yeah. Well, why do you say that? It's like, because this is what I do, man. Laser focus. This is all I've invested my life in doing. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, elk comes by screaming. He's at 50 yards. I'm like, man, we're about to, we ain't about to shoot at him. We're about to kill it. And you know, so I don't know. That That is one thing, too. So there is a major line in the sand between this cockiness arrogance and confidence and, and unbelievable <laughs> humility. But every time something like that's accomplished to where if it's you, the humility and thankfulness comes back. It doesn't make you more arrogant. It, it still gives you that confidence, but it makes you so unbelievable humble to think like for me, and I know you feel this way is like, thank you God for giving me this opportunity and, ab oh, yeah. and ability and this, this thought process to involve myself at a deep passion level to, to better myself. And, and some of it could be maybe just ability that was given, but a lot of it is just you, you start thinking at that time, it's like, well, man, I, should, I think to myself, we should have won. And the reason I think that is because I, I, n I didn't put that much time in riding a dirt bike. I didn't put that much time in baseball. Yeah. I didn't put that much time in baseball, football, even though I played all through high school. But I put an enormous amount of hours into turkey calling to buying condoms and cutting them up 
Yeah. I think of how many hours did you spend. I'm talking about maybe you started oh. at five or six o'clock and ate a can of beanie weenies and you're piddling with airs and shooting and paper tuning. You took this rest off. You put that overdraw on like, oh, I'm going back to I this. I don't field. regret it at all. Though. And then it's all of a sudden you look, how many times you look and it's four o'clock in the morning? It, oh, a bunch. It, it, I don't regret it at all. It's just, it, it's a, uh, yeah, I don't, re- I don't regret it at all. It's, uh, and I still do it. I mean, yeah, don't really have to, but I still do it. I mean, I do uh, too. Yeah, I, I do too. Cohen called me yesterday, and I was sitting there in, down in the basement, you know, working on stuff. I get down there, and I just we got arrow tuner, arrow tuner that we're working on that that uh that I I built and uh you know designed or whatever, and I've been playing with that, and you know I'm thinking about arrow. I mean, I just constantly just think of all that stuff. I mean, even if we're I'm not in the shop, I'm just always thinking about that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. I was going to tell a funny story before I forgot it. You know, when you when you remember, you know, talking about how we are like brotherly, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how we think of each other. Like you said, you know, it bothers you when someone else talks about me or Nick or, or oh. whatever. It's like nobody's going to give each other more crap than we give each other. No, I can. Ha- yeah, however, we can be sarcastic. Yeah. You know. That, however, but, if somebody from the outside, boy, steps I got in, ready to swing. Yeah, exactly. So that, the, there is a, you know, we talk about brotherhood, but there is a deep brotherly love amongst all of us. But I remember when we were hunting in Indiana, and I've always had a problem with meaning like not the confidence of shooting or the accuracy of it. Whereas, you know, I've always bragged upon you as you know, you're you're an accurate shot, you're a good shot. However where you shine is like the 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 switch goes off when the animal comes out it's like you're looking for that nanosecond of opportunity I'm going to kill this thing whereas mm-hmm. I have the mentality of uh of of being extremely accurate and dissecting the shot so much that I'm waiting for the perfect moment to execute it and this was early on this is probably been 8 9 10 years ago mm-hmm. but not that I can't make the shot or or don't feel confident in the shot. I'm just confident in the time to take the shot, if that makes sense. Sometimes, so my mentality, rather than going to, I'm fixing to kill this buck, I'm fixing to wear this buck out to where I'm thinking, don't screw up, don't pick the wrong time. Do I know when to, you know, do I know right. when to shoot it? A lot of times a deer cooperate and give you the, the opportunity that you want, but there's a lot of times that I miss that opportunity well, naturally, the camera catches everything. So we go back to camp, the 160-something inch deer. I, th- I remember in a food, oh, yeah. was he in a food plot or something. Yeah, he was in a food plot. He stepped out there, and, you know, he's probably 53 or 4 yards. I think he's coming closer. I'm wanting him to come closer. Not that I don't have the ability to shoot 50-something yards. It's just I'm like, I'm going to wait for the best opportunity to maximize the opportunity to do it, whereas what I should have done is shot the darn thing at 52 yards. Hindsight's always twenty twenty. Well, you called me on the carpet on that. I mean, and just like a, 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 a I'm gonna say big brother, you're younger than me, <laughs> but a big brother, you browbeat me for about an hour and a half during lunchtime. I like, remember that. I'm like, I mean, just like whoop me up and down. I'm like, man, I can't believe I'm getting this out of Waddell. I'm like, he goes, man, you've made that shot a million times. Waddell's going, you've made that shot a million times. You gotta take that shot. You gotta switch gears. That ain't foam out there. You gotta be a killer. I and, remember and, and, that. I mean, that's almost a turning point in my career. I'm like, I got little Waddell on my shoulders, like, kill that deer, kill that deer. And, you know, and since then, I've done better at it. But still, nonetheless, you've got that mentality of, like, you know, you're going to seize the opportunity. you got to take the shot because, you know, shoot maybe, no shoot, no maybe. Whereas I'm, like, waiting for the perfect opportune time of head down and, you know, uh, not so much now, but back then, that's the way I was. And you... You, uh, I remember you tough that. loved me right into taking a shot. And I think the next day I shot at the, the same deer. He had you just shot him way end. out there. It was like 80 something yards. <laughs> he goes, that. Yeah. And then what else said? He goes, Man, I know you missed, but I'm proud you shot. Yeah. I was so proud you shot. <laughs> but I, I do, I do remember that specific because they come back and we're looking at footage. You said, What? He was, man, I had him at 53. And I think you even gave, and it's amazing people because they do see, us giving each other hell a lot like you yeah. know it's funny you know we all pick on each other and you know all of us and, and that's what brothers do that's what family and maybe it's i don't know if it's a southern thing maybe nick walked into this from the west but i if i like somebody especially yeah. if i love them yeah i ain't gonna start off with come here old buddy i love you i'm gonna say you owe some oh you yeah know? Exactly. i mean like what you old bad i mean it's exactly. just it's a i don't know it's like in 
I just, maybe that's us. I don't no, know. No, no, we constantly. But I remember that deer because he come out in a food plot, and you made the comment even, which I thought was unbelievable, which goes to humility and your belief in me. You said, "Why well, you'd have probably killed him?" But dead gum, I was waiting for that perfect shot. And as I watched the footage, I got pissed because at the same time I'm thinking all these conversations I brag on T Bone. You know, if we walk up and it's all these hunting person, I was like, T Bone's gonna whoop all y'all. You know, and, and of course you you turned it into like you would have probably shot him and killed him right there. You know. And I, and I remember what I said, I was pissed. I said, T-Bone, if we walk out here in this yard right now, and we was in, I remember it was up there with Al Collins and Chris Collins, oh, yeah. which are confident, great archers. Yeah. I said, you will beat everybody in this barn. If we go out there right now, 70, 80, 100 yards, I don't care who comes walking in here limping or running barefoot. It could be Cameron Haynes, John Dudley, anybody. You're going to whoop them all. <laughs> I mean, I would have bet money. I don't care. I mean, there's all these personalities. T-Bone Turner, I'll put my money on him. He's Alabama Roll Tide UGA right now this year. Put your money on this guy. And what pissed me off about you not shooting, I'm thinking, T-Bone, you you just told me I would have probably killed him, and you can outshoot me any day of the week. So that, to me, was a point to where, as a friend, I was like, what is going to make T-Bone flip that tr- switch? I had some same similar conversations you know, w- with with Nick, but yeah. vice versa, I had a lot of people tell me that, and vice versa, you you grab me and snatch me and say like, "What else? Look at this. There is a mark on your arrow." I'm like, well, there's mark on a lot of all mares, and you're like, "Yeah, that's because your freaking bow is out of tune and it's hitting this." I'm like, "Well, I'm like, did you know, I remember one time I've shot a deer in Oklahoma, and and I shot it. It was about a twenty-four or five yard close shot, but you called me right after the show aired, and he's like, "What else?" You're embarrassing me. And I said, what? And he said, that deer you just shot in Oklahoma, you smoked him, but that's a reflection on me. I said, what are you talking about? I said, that arrow flew like crap. You said, you didn't get Cohen to check on that? And I was like, no. I said, I I mean, I shot out in the yard and I noticed it was kicking a little bit, but I was hitting a dot, you know, and and you said, what else? Next week, I'm coming to fix that boat. We got to. Yeah. We got to. And yeah. so I I think, you know, and, and, and this is kind of a conversation, the relationship is, I don't think people realize the confidence. And, and I do. I, I call it a band because, you know, sometimes yeah. I play the guitar. Sometimes you play the drum. Sometimes you're on lead vocal. Sometimes it's Nick. No, I take that back. Nick's always on lead vocals. He's always on lead vocals. Yeah, if yeah. you don't know Nick Munn, if there's a one guitar strum. Yep. And and, and Nick is... It, and now, this strum could be coming from Billy Gibbons. Yeah. It could, might be Prince that's come back from the grave. Oh, and yeah, he's we've about seen to do a that. concert. And he, he's going to tap Prince. And, hey, man, how about Boston Prison Blues? I'll sing it if you just... Do it, me. <laughs> That's Nick. So he's our lead singer. Remember at Blake's wedding? Oh, he got God. Up there and you got to tell this story. So, I don't think I've ever told on a podcast. Blake, Blake's yeah. marriage. Yeah. First or yeah. second, whichever one. We went to a real secretive wedding. Can, no phones, no nothing. Everybody having a great time. Great food. We was dancing. Karaoke. Um, you know, and, and, and Nick loves to sing. Period. Loves it. Yeah. And then especially if he's feeling a little tipsy, he's going to sing. Not just love to, it ain't he's gon- gonna sing. Yeah. So uh, Kelly Clarkson and Reba McIntyre's up on stage and they're singing. I think Does, it was fancy or it was. Uh, Does he, he love, you? love you? Yeah. Like he loves exactly. Me. I mean, and, and we're then, sitting there like. Yeah, and 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 even them, you know, they they were a little tipsy, but man, they just killed killing it. it. Absolutely killed it. My so, wife's sitting there, tears coming oh out. Oh my gosh! I mean, yeah. this is just like an opera, like. Yeah, half of Nashville's there. Yeah. So Nick's turn on the karaoke, and Neil McCoy's the one that's actually uh, maestro for all the karaoke. So Neil McCoy calls Nick up there. Nick gets up there, and he grabs the mic, and he's fixing to sing Stray Cat Strut. And he goes, let me show you how it's done, Red. He says that for Reba McIntyre. And I'm like, we're about to get booted out of here, drug out of here on our ear. Nick says, let me show you how it's done, Red. Tell me make some comment about Neil McCoy. Like he said, so he, he basically just, which first of all, we're sitting there. What I remember, we're all sitting there and we're huddled up. And, and, yeah. and we're just having. We've the, been dancing, sweating. So it's like all star karaoke. If there's yeah. a such thing, this is all star A list karaoke. Yep. Reba, Kelly Clarkson. Uh, remember, uh, Lady Annabellum was there. Kelly uh, Pickler. Kelly Pickler. I, I mean, mean all these who, uh, amazing singers. Yeah. Bellamy Brothers. Oh, yeah. And so we're like, oh, my God, this is this is insane. Waylon Jennings' wife. Waylon J- Jesse Coulter. Yeah. Which, by the way, I got to dance with her. I cut yep. in. I, I told Chrissy, I said, you gotta, I got to, if you don't mind, I got to see if I can. Check could. that off the redneck I went list. and tapped her. I didn't tap her first, but I tapped her 
I think it was her fiance, and I said, yeah. if you don't mind, I sure would like to give Miss Jesse a spin right here, yeah. if you don't mind. And he said, yeah. go ahead. Oh, and I thought that was the coolest thing. You know? Oh, yeah. But anyway, I remember after Kelly and Reba sang, I remember thinking, who's going to come behind this? I mean, if Lady Annabelle's gonna step up right here, he better bring a uh, whoa, Bell and you better bring. So I'm mean, for sure it's gonna yeah. be. Nope, here comes Nick Mutt, and he I never to... he comes walking right out there, bro. I'm oh, sorry, and, and, I, and you remember too, Blake walks over. We're sitting there, and, and it's just our little bone collector group. Uh, your wife, uh, Nick, and all of us, and Christy, we're all sitting there, and Nick come, uh, Blake comes walking over, there, and all these celebrity guests, he comes walking over, and he puts his hand on my shoulder, and you're standing, there, and he said. He's got the biggest balls of any man in the hunting industry. <laughs> he, said, I remember. he said, there's nobody else in this room that would come sing behind that. But in one way, Nick saved the party because even, even your Dirks, Bentley, and all those guys there, they're not coming up singing behind no. that. But Nick put that gap in between. That's right. So everybody would Made know. everybody on the same level. So yeah. Matt Moret. I mean, he was sitting, Matt, Matt Moret sitting there just shaking his head, man, oh man. I was too. <laughs> I know in that. one way, I was like nervous and proud at the same time. And yeah. he actually did pretty good. You oh yeah, yeah. He, no, he, he does sing pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And then you talk about confidence. He does it, man. That's exactly right. It gets long, back to that. But he's humble, yeah. but he's confident. And he don't he don't care as long as he's got a place to set his phone for the lyrics on his knee or a mic stand where he can hold it right there. He's, he's money. One quick thing I tell you that gets on the singing thing of Nick because uh, we got a lot lot to talk about obviously. But um, another thing that's funny. You remember we were doing that thing at Can Cooker? Me, you, and Nick were supposed to go do the oh, celebrity yeah. cook off. <laughs> So Nick, full blown, has the flu. Like he, this is no. It probably a, was COVID. This was years ago. Yeah, I don't know what it was bad. But he was sick. And I will say, if you ever see. Myself, Nick, or T-Bone, and we're sick. We're sick. If we say we can't go, we just we can't go. Yeah. Well, Nick, we'd made it through the last little booth. You know, we'd left G5 over there talking he to says, the man, Grace. I'm going back. He said, man, I got to get back. I got to get back. And I said, okay, dude. He said, man, I can't get I said, well, look, we're all three supposed to be there, but I've always talked to Seth. You don't have to come to this thing, Nick. Yeah. He said, dude, tell you what, man, I can't. Let me just take a break over here. So Nick, literally, we get there, and they got drapes. I remember Donna Candy Kiski. And all a lot of per, you know the can. It was cooker. kind of a cook off. It was a cook off. Yeah. Everybody cooked this their favorite meal in the can cooker. Yep. We had our ingredients. So me, and, I said Nick, crawl. I had Cheetos table. as appetizers. For yes, everybody. that's exactly. You had Cheetos. In the, in yeah, the can yeah appetizers. <laughs> and so we start cooking. You're passing out tea. And Nick is so sick that if you remember, there's a card table. He crawls under the table and lays down. If you remember, I remember that, he lays down at our feet. So nobody knows Nick's there in the drape. He's just resting, just curled up, shaking, running a fever. And, um, you know, and, and we're kicking every once in a while just to let them know we're there. But uh, all of a sudden, this house band starts up. And you hear, hey, everybody, glad to be at the ATA and welcome can cook and or cook like off. And it's yeah. like 40 yards yeah. to our right in, That's a big, right in an atrium. I mean, and all of a sudden, you know, country music, sing. they start singing house music. Nick hits his head on the table. Hey, is, there, is that a band? Yeah. Within the first song. Nick is out from under that table and walking, gets behind stage and walks up and asks, and is tapping the, the guy singing. If it, and, 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 and it wasn't even five minutes later, he's doing Folsom and Prison Blues up Folsom there with the Folsom Prison Blues. You we that? know his set list, don't we? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Most of the time, I got to I gotta bring the guitar for him. I know it. I, 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 if I, I, the, it's the same picture every time. And, you know, me and Christy and Mallory, because I don't get up there as much as, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I can only play the Jew harp or a moonshine bottle, but... Nonetheless, when whenever you and him are up there, or we're in a you know just in a private setting or whatever, you're sitting there with the you couldn't have a bigger smile on your face because I know because you're laughing like that, and then Nick's over there, man, and it's the I same know it's going to be still of the night, yeah, you know, the, Mallory, white snake, still of the night, and yep, you know it's going to be old habits, yep, it's going to be Folsom Prison Blues, exactly. And uh, as a matter of fact, while we're on that, talking about things that we've put ourselves into, I feel like as a hunting person, I was, first of all. We've never allowed pro on our name. Like I no. know, yeah, it's one thing we just keep out of contract. No. Almost to the point where I remember arguing with Thompson Center one year on the ad. I was like, man, you know, they want to have me one of the pro hunters. I said, no, you can have everybody's pro hunter. I just want hunter because I don't like pro. Yeah, no, we're not. I guess in one way we are pro from promotional. If you want to put the promotional, we do promote these products and promote the culture. But um, I never forget one thing I remember always us believing in is like we're hunters. But a hunting show, and I think sometimes that's what misses the mark at times to where hunting is entertaining, but a lot of times as a host or a production, you know, if you do good production, good editing, and good, you know, hosting, if that's what you want to call it, whether yeah. shooting a deer or talking or cutting a joke, 
we've always tried to consider ourselves we have to entertain and if we entertain in the right way it will turn people on to the space and possibly sell a hunt license and the culture will grow exactly that's always been our kind of synopsis of our job just like you said when we're talking to folks and doing seminars and stuff you know we, we have the mentality of half the people in the audience are way better hunters than we are yes you know we just happen to have a camera documenting what yeah. we're doing and i've always said the mentality and i know you do this too because you and i've talked about it a lot to where if we all of a sudden up on stage let's say it's a seminar i feel like that just a minute ago i was sitting here and for some reason some promoter or somebody said hey you you three guys come up here and talk yeah and i'm so i'm almost talking from i'm talking yeah. here but I'm, I'm i'm talking from this perspective yeah and, and i never forget we have gotten ourselves in so many binds and and one i remember remember is it grapevine texas we did that promotion for cabela's yeah and huh. <laughs> I know you know where i'm going I jack ingram going. was yeah, doing yeah, a concert yeah, yeah, yeah. for some yeah. reason i was told that i conveyed to you and nick i said look I said, man, it's going to be a cool opportunity. Jim Shockey, all these, again, a lot of hunting personalities there, but they asked us, the bone collector crew, that I was told was, can you come up and introduce Jack Ingram and welcome everybody to the concert? Basically just MC. MC, Like an MC. And I thought it was going to be like, hey, I'm up here. It's my buddy T-Bone, my buddy Nick, and welcome, man. Cabela's having this big throwdown, and Jack Ingram's coming. Guys, y'all party, get your... I thought that was going to be our job, and I told y'all that. Well, just before we get ready to do this, if you remember the uh, the girl behind the scenes who didn't know who, who we were, no. she just had it on her bill that the bone collector band was going to come up and yeah. entertain for 15 minutes before Jack Ingram goes on. We Somehow, we and I said, <laughs> and she said, well, y- y- y'all didn't come to sound check. I said, no, nah, I, mean, I mean, you know, we're just, this is T-Bone, this is Nick, we're just here to introduce Jack Ingram. Like, dude, I got y'all in for 15 minutes. And I think Jack, which most of these Jack Ingram fans were not necessarily just come from Cabela's, they they booked and come in. You know, this yeah, red yeah. dirt Jack Ingram concert. So not everybody knew who we were and we're not even hunters. And I remember we got up there and uh, and I said, dude. And Nick was like, dude, let's sing a few, quick. And I said, well, I don't even have a guitar, man. Y'all don't have a guitar, nothing. So I remember Jack Ingram kind of was in and out and i never met jack ingram in my life and i remember i walked up there and there's jack and i tapped him on the shoulder i said hey jack hey and he you know so i i, I got credentials so i'm supposed to be back there but in my guitar tech and my yeah. part of the sound crew and i remember shaking i said look you don't know me but my name is michael waddell you know we, we do a show called bone collector but i guess we're, we thought we we're going to introduce you but i think we're supposed to there's 15 minutes and I said, so I have these two questions. One is, do you have some good, you know, house music to keep pumping the crowd up? Or, or, or how to, oh, you're the opening band. I said, no, we're not the opening band. We don't play music. We're just goofball, fun, loving, gut pile making hunting guys. But yeah, I, remember I said, that. I can play a little bit. So anyways, well, here, I said, but can I borrow one of your guitars? And, we'll, and he said, well, yeah. And I never get, he, he looks over and says, just get that one. It had Ingram on the strap. It was his guitar. And, um. I remember a guy says, isn't standard tuning? He said, yeah, you know, that was my only music question. So I remember we walk up there and we do Nick's playlist. And you remember you rap Vanilla Ice, Ice Ice yeah. Baby. And yeah. I remember thinking, and we walked off high-fiving like we just escaped the lines <laughs> then. And everybody was laughing. And even later that night, we get over to the to a bar. And you remember, and this girl comes up and she, she hugs and she says, oh, my God, where are y'all playing again? Y'all are great. And I said, man, we're we're not, we're not a band. Not at all. And I'm like, no, we're not. And it was just like a, yeah, I don't you know. You said it right. Escape the lines, Dan. It was. We've done like, it so oh, many man, times. Yeah. yeah, it was a hoodoo. It was a hoodoo for sure. <laughs> it was like 15 minutes. I remember you called Jim Shockey out too on that. I did. Yeah. That was I did. Funny. <laughs> well, we was always pulling it off. And right quick before we get into some some deeper stuff, but um, who right now, T Bone? If we pull it back to Archie, who right now, past and present? in the archery world who, who's the top gun or who, who's somebody that's like wow this guy's a machine or, or th- this right here is gonna be hard to beat yeah there's a um i just watched the lancaster uh, indoor they had it live on youtube so i watched it this past sunday and they had the shoot down and that's indoor you know i, I didn't do a lot of indoor that's 20 yards shooting a dot 20 yards shooting at a dot and they, they they actually incorporated a 12 ring down in the so if you did get behind, you could climb back up. So it's not just falling off. But there's yeah. nothing outside of that. No, no, it's a seven or a six. So you either get a 12 or you get a seven or a six. Essentially, you, you might as well get a zero because yeah. you're not coming back from that. Uh, there's just no way. 
unless the other guy's string breaks or something like that. But, um, you know, 3D wise and just all around, you know, Levi Morgan is, is, you know, he's been that way for 15 years. Just, I'm glad I got out about the time. Just an animal. Yeah. I'm like, whoo. Yeah. Not, not that I was, a you know, winning every time I, I, I jumped up there, but I'd like to think that I was a threat some of the time. And, you know, made a made a few podiums throughout my career, but uh, I'm glad I kind of got out about the time Levi was coming on because he's like a machine. But there, you know, there's a lot of good archers out there. The Goza brothers, uh, Dan McCarthy, um, you know, Tate Morgan. There's a there's a lot of great uh, archers out there uh, that are doing real well. You know, Hoyt's uh, always been on top of the podium as far as uh, long distance. You know, the the field archery, the feet arounds, as well as the mm -hmm. indoor and actually. Uh, you know, while we're recording this, tomorrow is the start of Vegas. It's the Vegas tournament. Which so the Vegas shoot down, the, all the, the indoor is, Vegas shoot. Yep. 50, but you'll have Europeans and everybody come over Everybody, that. yeah, 50,000 yeah. first place. So wow. it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a who's who. But, you know, a lot of the older guys, you know, like uh, uh, Jeff, uh, gosh, why can't I remember his last name? Uh, but, but a lot of the older like guys. Like Gillingham, he's still doing Gillingham, he's still yeah, he won, actually. He he's won. been doing a long time. Yeah, he has. He's yeah. over 50 now. He's a senior now. And uh, um, uh, little Jackie Cottle. Jackie Cottle, goes, I think he still goes to the 3 And his tournament. son still. Sh 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 er, yeah, Shannon, I think he's preaching now. Yeah, is he really? Yeah, he's preaching now. He doesn't go to the tournaments anymore. But, yeah, Jackie does. Jackie's, That's as long awesome. as he's been the string, he's always going to be He always there. had that Elvis hair, man. Oh, yeah, Jackie man. Jackie had that. Really. Like a helmet. <laughs> that, 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 that hair wasn't made putting no hat on. So. Yep. Yep, but uh, no, there's there's a lot of the same guys are still out there, and you know, and I and I miss it, but you know, we're you know with us, we have a, a lot busier time doing promotions on the weekends and hunting and stuff like that. So you know, time just doesn't allow to compete, and especially on the level that it was, you know, way back in the '90s and early 2000s when I yeah. shot so much. But uh, yeah, it it would be nice to go to a, a tournament and just even if you just walked around and hang hung out. I haven't done that in a couple of years, but. I still watch it, you know, I right. keep up with the results and, you know, keep up with them and, you know, watch a lot of the tips and follow them on social media and things like that. So, uh, you know, I, I just can't get enough of it. Anything happened to the Randy adulting? Olmers, you ever have a chance to talk to Randy much anymore? Uh, it's been a little while. Randy's just doing hunting and, uh, you know, his boys are, uh, you know, they're, they're at the age of early twenties and stuff like that. He's just spending a lot of time with them hunting and, uh, you know, just kind of slowing down. He's a little bit older than we are. He's, right. He's bumping 60 now, but, you know, still fit as a fiddle and uh, still hunting quite a lot. But he's doing he's doing good, you know, always killing big stuff. Is it fair to say take a Randy Ulmer in the archery world to where could have been one of the first they would have considered kind of a goat to where if maybe he was the Joe Montana of his time to where Levi's becoming That's right. the Tom Brady to a degree? That's right. Know? Yeah, um, back in our day, you know, Ulmer. Ulmer was, I remember like, a, yeah. He yeah, there's the probably five or ten guys that were always going to be in the top three like that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Alan Connor, yeah. uh, Pete Works. You know, yep. a lot of those guys were always up 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 on the top podium. Uh, I'm drawing blank on the name, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good guys. Well, it's amazing. And, and, and one thing to talk about that that's, that's actually something you've not talked about, you know, you know, prior to this is – Obviously, in life, we go through all these changes, and we're reminiscing yep. on all these times we've shared in camp and just stories and crazy stories. But but I know that this past October, this crazy, that this is the first day I've seen you since our bone collector bash That's right. up at Whitaker Gun. I mean, we talk Derek all Carraway. the time. Yeah, we talk and on the phone, but hadn't physically seen it because you, you've been fighting something that really – uh, I think has come to a head now, not only in your knowledge of what, what you're up against, but also, too, it's amazing that the fans, we, we're right now Aaron Bone Collector, we're about four shows deep into it, and I'm starting to get a lot of people like, hey, where's T-Bone? You know, hey, what? well, I saw T-Bone got a nice buck in Georgia. What else did he get, or what did he do? Or, yep. I, I, you know, you were at ATA, where's T-Bone? We're getting ready, um, going to National Turkey Federation Convention. People are like, where's T-Bone? And obviously, uh, in, in, in this past fall, you, you you went through a tremendous fight and a lot of changes and and you know right now I know you want to kind of start discussing some of that and, yeah and so yeah share with the people what's been happening T Bone yeah it's um it's it's been definitely uh, the last six or seven months has been a, a big change and you know like now that we have some clarity and a better understanding you know we kind of kept it uh you know just our core people you know I didn't talk about it much to many people because you know to be quite honest. Didn't know what was going on. Didn't know what roads was ahead. 
uh, and was just focusing on the fight, you know. So right. all throughout the fall, you know, I, I let, you know, my close friends and family, you know, 20, 25 people, you know, and asked them to kind of keep a tight lip on things just until we figured things out because I, I had no idea, you know, I, I was just mainly focused on that. But uh, anyway, to, to in, in the summer, um, I, I was in the hospital actually at the end of July because I had a tick bite on my left leg mm -hmm. that it got infected. So I had to have standard pill antibiotics wasn't doing the trick. So I had to get IV antibiotics. So I was just, I wasn't over there overnight. I was just in there for the emergency room getting my antibiotics. Well, I had a bump. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but we was all hunting in Northern Wisconsin about 10 years ago. I do remember. And I fell in some deep snow and I landed on a stump. Didn't bust the skin or nothing, but it really bruised my shin on my right leg. There's a couple feet under the snow, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I fell on it and it, you know, it, it was just like landing on a Coke can, a stump about the Coke can, the size of the Coke can. Didn't bust the skin, but it caused a deep bruise. And, uh, you know, I got it checked out whenever I got back home from when we was on that hunting trip. And they said... It's probably going to be a hematoma. It's going to be there for a while. And if you, anybody knows anything about a hematoma, it takes a while to absorb back into your system and or it can just be a knot for from now on. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's been around for about 10 years, just a, just a little little hump, you know, basically like a hump on my shin. Not a lot of meat, not a lot of skin on the front of your shin. But right beside that, in, when I was in the hospital in July, I had a little bump about the size of a grape right beside that. And I asked them while I was in there because they had given me an ultrasound because anytime you have something going on with your legs, they want to check your circulation. And I said, what about this right here? And they said, well, it does have its own blood supply, but just keep an eye on it. It's probably nothing. It's just a cyst or, you know, I'm thinking Dr. Pimple Popper, go to the yeah, doctor, yeah. you know, they're going to lance it, pop it, you know, and, you know, getting older and that, that, that's all it is. That's what I'm thinking. So about three week three weeks we're all on. I'm past the, the the tick bite, the antibiotics, and everything like that. Well, the 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 knot that was on there had grown. It's doubled in size now. It's about the size of a golf bar, a little bigger. So I'm like, well, I need to get my primary care, which I'm good friends with Doctor Alford. Uh, I go see him, and he goes like, yeah, man, that's peculiar. He goes, we need to probably nothing to it, but we need to keep an eye on it. We're going to put you in touch with a general surgeon, which is uh, Ralston Majors which turns out, you know, you know, he's just like me, Alford, and, uh, you know, he's an outdoorsman. Yeah. Good friends with Dustin Lynch. Actually, he's his roommate with Dustin Lynch. And went and seen him. We hit it off great. I knew his dad. His dad had did my uh, 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 gallbladder surgery several, several years before. He's now a surgeon. I went and seen him, and he goes, he goes, yeah, because we need to take a look at it, but I need to see what's going on underneath it and everything like that. So he scheduled an MRI, and you know, nothing moves fast in the medical, you know, it's right. like you schedule appointment and then you got seven to 10 days before you go do this. And each of these seven to 10 days, this thing's growing like crazy. So it's, it's now we're into September. I go, go to see him. Now it's the size of a tennis ball. I go to the MRI, they do the MRI and they can see that there's a mass underneath there that's intertwined within my muscles. And so my, it has now come this mass come out of your skin. No, no, no. It's still, it's not broke loose yet, but it's I big. It's, it's growing right big. right up under your skin. But the mass is under the skin, intertwined within my muscles and my ligaments. And I'm still thinking, you know, I'm not even thinking cancer or anything like that. I'm thinking, you know, it's just a tumor that's gone crazy. We got to, you know, it's about time to, we need to operate on this thing. Yeah. Put a little mercurochrome on this exactly, thing. Exactly. Big time. Yeah. So I go back to see him and, uh, at, at, at like four or five days later after he reads the MRIs and gets the MRI. So I go into his office and the morning that I'm going to see him, it busts through the skin. So it's bleeding like crazy. It had bust through the skin because there's just no, no room for it to go anywhere else. I go into the office and we're looking at it. It's the end of September. He looks at it and says, man, we, you know, it, it's a mass. I don't really know what's going on. I, you know, before we have a plan of attack, I need to know what this thing is. We need to do a biopsy. And he was going to schedule mm -hmm. it. He goes, do you want to do it right now or do you want me to schedule this? And I'm like, no, nah, let's do it right now. So he he numbed it up right there in the office. And, you know, I'd sent you the picture of like when he done ran the biopsy, it's squirting blood out yes. everywhere. And, and uh, you know, it was, it was pretty traumatic kind of. And it, it's big and he gets a good sample, sends it off. Well, it takes about seven to days. Now we're rocking on. It's the first part of October, like October 1st into September. The pathology report comes back and it, it is cancer. And so mm -hmm. it is, it's fibrosarcoma, which fibrosarcoma is a real rare type of cancer. It's only about 15,000 cases per year. So I know I've got cancer now. And uh, we then he switches gears and sends me to Emory 
the uh, in Atlanta, which is the Winship Cancer Center, which is they're well versed with sarcoma type patients. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of your cancer uh, centers are well versed in it, but just because it's so rare. But they in specialize our, in, in it. Southeast. Yeah, they kind of specialize in it. MD Anderson, as well as the Mayo Clinic does, too. But, you know, there's a lot to be said with being close and being able to get back and forth. So, right. We chose the Emory Winship Cancer Center. We went there. They wanted their own pathology to look at it because there's about 50 to 60 different types of sarcoma. They wanted to make sure that their pathology report determined what type of cancer it is so that we could treat it the correct way. Because if you treat it the wrong type of way with the wrong type of chemos and such, you're just going to be wasting time. Sarcoma usually stays localized. However, when it does move, it's, it tends to go to your lung first. So we had to do a CAT scan. In the meantime, while we're waiting on this pathology report to come back, which actually took like 25 days, I get a CAT scan and another MRI done. Now the CAT scan shows that I got a nodule on my left lung, which it's a nine millimeter uh, size nodule, which people have nodules on their lungs all the time. As long as they're like four millimeters or less, they really don't really think much about it. Mm -hmm. But because this one was so large, they were suspect that it was the same type of sarcoma that had already moved to my lung. So with that said, you know, I'm thinking like by now we're at the end of October and this is when we were at the Brotherhood Bash. And, That's right. And I showed you the pictures of these things have already busted out. I had, you know, three large, like I, I say they look like uh, portobello mushrooms is what they look like. You know, yeah. they're busted out of the skin. I know it's kind of gross to tell you about it, but they're out of the skin. They're living out of, out of the skin because they had got nowhere to go. Plus there's a mass inside and, you know, they're basically like, three squished softballs on my leg. So it's taking mm -hmm. up a lot of room and, you know, jeans are getting tight. I'm constantly having to change dressing, you know, once and twice yeah. and to, you know, a day. Well, the cat skin comes back and I'm thinking like, man, we got to cut this off. We got to get this cut out of my leg. You know, that's the reaction that you want to have. Yeah. But the oncology team, and it is a team at the <clears throat> Winship Cancer Center, they said, we don't need to react because it's going to do no good to, you know, to amputate your leg or remove the tumors. If you're already in your vitals, you already have cancer in your vitals. There's no need in doing that. So they wanted to attack that. So that's when we came up with the plan of the really aggressive chemo treatments of two types of chemo every three weeks. I'd have to be admitted to the hospital. I'd stay there five days and get chemo for five days. And it, it was a lot rougher than what I had thought it was going to be Jolly. anyway. So anyway, I went through that and, we're, we're trying to take care and make sure I don't have cancer anywhere else in my body and it's just localized to my to my leg. So um, fast forward all the way to several different treatments. We get us to the end of the year. I spent Christmas uh, in the hospital and everything and I'm, you know, still have the chemo and, you know, basically just I'm getting blood transfusions every time. I'm getting platelet transfusions. We do another CAT scan at the end of the year and luckily this is a good sign that the, the nodule is still in my lung. However, it's not changed in size Same at size, all. So it did not grow. So they're saying that's a good sign without doing a biopsy. That's a good sign that it shows that it's not a sarcoma. Okay. Th that it's not related. It may be cancer on its own, but it looks like, you know, in all practical purposes, 95% sure that I don't have any cancer not in my body. Not connected to what's no, on your leg. No, no. Okay. So, so as of the end of the year, which I've got to do a, a um, in two days, I got to do another CAT scan to see where we're at now that I'm six weeks out of uh, chemo because you can't have operation on that. Now we're going to focus on my leg. And so next week, you know, I don't know when this is going to air or whatever, but the first week of February, I, I, it's so large and so big and so intertwined within my bones and stuff. There's no way to effectively move it. And fibrosarcoma, if you don't get 100% of it, it will come back. No ifs, ands, or buts. Chemo don't kill it. You can't get rid of it with chemo. Chemo would just stun it uh, a little bit, and that's about it. So they are black looking now, and they are kind of died off a little bit. So but the it, chemo did stun it. Stun it, yeah. It just held it back a little bit, but it's still, now that we're six weeks out, they're growing again. So wow. they're growing again on my leg. But that brings us to, you know, surgery. We can't remove it because we can't effectively remove it, or we can't say, we're going to be able to remove it. Otherwise, if we try to remove it, we're not going to get it all and it's going to come back. So the only uh, uh, answer is to amputate. So we're going to have to amputate my leg above the knee to remove all the sarcoma that is below the knee. And uh, so I'll be no more kicking field goals. I'll be one-legged from this wow. point on. 
And, uh, you know, hopefully the CAT scans that I'm fixing to take in two days show that I'm still clear in here. And, uh, you know, essentially, if everything is like what we think, the doctor tells me that I will be cancer free. I won't have it in my leg anymore. And, uh, you know, we'll have to watch the nodule in my lung, but he's saying that I will be cancer free just minus one leg. So um, I'll, I'll be shopping around for some prosthetics here Golly. in a couple of five or six months. So. Yeah. And, and you know what, uh, yeah. you know, you know, I, I say all that to give you the, the story on that, but through this whole thing, I kind of knew that that's the way it's going to be. So I've been preparing for the amputation since October. I kind of knew that that's where it was going to end up going, but I don't know why I'm at peace with it. It's not, you know, it'd be real easy for me to sit here and say, you know, woe is me. You know, I, you know, I got so much else I want to do and I, and I do, you know, I do want to live and I'm still going to fight by no means, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm at peace with things. You know, we talk all the time about things I've done in life. I've already, I've already way outlived my dreams, you know, and, and, and it makes me focus on the simple things, you know, like I've told you, I'm, I know I'm broken record to you, but like the little things of going to eat lunch with my buddies or, you know, and, and, you know, just working on the skid steer and, and, uh, you know, working on the tractor and doing things at home and, you know, maybe, maybe showing up at a, you know, a, a, an archery tournament and shooting a few arrows and, you know, th those things are the little things that people take for granted mm -hmm. so much in life is what I'm focused on is what I want to be able to do and what I want to be able to, you know, r live my life on. Those are the things that mean the most to me and that are the, the most important, you know, not that I don't have dreams and I'm not, I'm appreciative of man, it'd be nice to go kill another, you know, a, a, another deer and so-and-so or go to, you know, kill a moose. Um, I, I'm almost, I'm almost okay with that. You know, it's, it's not like my life has been shortchanged because I didn't get to do that. You know I mean? I don't feel, I, I still feel blessed if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm at, I got my great friends. I got a wealth of support through my family, uh, and friends and, and that, that's what means the most to me, you know, sharing time, sh shooting the bull like what we do and hanging out with you and Nick. I mean, even if I go to camp and all I can do is drop you off at the stand, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. I, I don't have to be, you know, going with my hair on fire and, uh, you know, g going to do 40 events a year, speaking at these engagements. Not that I will miss it, but I don't have to do that. I don't have to to be fulfilled. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. have to do that to feel fulfilled. I don't have to, you know, trying to fill every tag that I draw every year. Uh, you know, I don't have to do that. I want to be a part of it just because, you know, hunting and archery is our DNA and I still want to do that in land management, but I'm just so looking forward to just being entwined in it, just, to, just a part of it, you know? So I, I don't know, mm. you know, I don't know what the next five months holds for me. But I, I, I'm at a, you know, I'm at, I'm at peace with, with what, what's going to happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I got the right mindset going into this. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, so, do, you, do you even grasp the inspiration of what you're saying, even to me? Like I'm, I'm fighting back tears, even hearing the inspirational, the story, because, yeah. you know, and I think, I mean, I mean, you know, it's funny when I think of bone collector and all we've experienced you've always been the big guy. Yeah. You know, you've always been the, the big guy to where, you know, if we walk in seven miles, you know, man, T-bone, you can make it a, make it a mile. Yeah. But arguably, obviously humble, you would, you would never admit to, admit to this, but you're one of the most recognizable personalities in our outdoor space. And to me, I'm just overwhelmed at the inspiration that you've always been, regardless of what you're going through now, just, I, I've always had that, this guy's on my team mentality to where if it's shooting a bow or, you know, and I, and I see people doing all these amazing things physically, I've always been like, yeah, well, my guy, T-Bone, you know, he's part of this team and probably never going to go get a, get a doll sheep up on the very top of some mountain. But he's as a successful outdoorsman and hunter as anybody out there. And, and when I look at it, the depth of it, of where you've been able to go and tell your story of archery and adventure and, and perseverance, it, it almost feels like to me it is, it's good Lord's way of just pushing even more inspiration through you of once again up against this fight and this battle that helps people realize 
hopefully they realize it and, and, and are not above or self-absorbed among themselves to one is maybe look in the mirror and say, Lord, I'm, I'm capable of doing this thing. And if, I, if my man T-Bone has done all this and accomplished this based on his setbacks and what he's had, I, 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 don't, I don't know what could be more inspirational. And it's funny, even though a lot of this I know because we have talked and you did share it with a small group of friends. Um, it's been amazing for people to realize that in our conversation, it's, it's been us that's been crying. I mean, it's like I hang up the phone and I'm tore up and I'm trying to think of something motivational and you're, you're telling me these things that sound like very bad news. And, and I'm, I'm the one, because typically when you tell somebody your sorrows, usually that friend, you tell them because that friend can say, oh man, head up, bro. Kind of like you're talking about in Indiana when I was like, T-Bone, yeah. you're the best. Get your butt out there. You was down, you didn't get the shot and I'm sitting there kicking you to get you back motivated. I found it so unbelievable to find that in you telling the story of what you're personally going through, you're not even looking for us for the motivation. You're motivating us to not worry about you. And with that, it's just another part of the inspiration and the humility. And so yeah, I have no doubt that you, you will get through this. And Yeah, I, I don't know why. I don't know why I feel that way. I, I guess I've always been wired as a people pleaser. I'm, I'm more at peace if the people around me are content and happy than if I am, because I've always been big and I've always had, you know, to deal with being the big guy in the room or the fat jokes and stuff like that. I don't know if I've got a scarred armor because of it. Um, I, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's, you know, it's just what I've been dealt. So I, I've, I've dealt with it and I've made the most of it. And, you know, like you had mentioned before, people need to look like look at being in the outdoors or anything that you do in the outdoors or anything that you do in life don't let something define you don't let don't let if you can't do a sheep hunt that don't define you no. as an outdoorsman even if you're just going out there killing three squirrels a year you're an outdoorsman don't let that define you don't let your capabilities or non capabilities or your size or your age or anything like that if you can scratch that it that let that define you you know do what you want to do be happy about it and and you know i i don't know i again i can't explain why i'm so at peace with it and uh i i don't know i just i've always been that way i want people comfortable around me because yeah, yeah you know I, I mean i've always I, I you know and i'm not saying that for sympathy and i'm not saying any of this for sympathy or i'm just basically explaining it but you know, I don't want people, you know, it's like I, I never, I didn't want people coming to see me. It's not like I didn't want them, but I wanted them to know that they didn't have to come yeah. see me. I'm okay. I mean, I, it means a lot to me to let folks know that I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, no matter how bad, no matter how bad we got it or you think you got it, you know, it's real easy to have a pity party and have your lip poked out and think that life's giving you a, a bad hand. There's so many people out there that's got it so much worse. You know what I mean? So yeah. much worse. And, you know, who am I to sit here and complain, you know, because, I mean, I've, I've lived an un unbelievable dream. I mean, if it ended tomorrow, I've lived an unbelievable dream and an unbelievable life, you know, thanks to great friends and stuff. So that's that's an, such an unbelievable testament to grace that lives within you that so many people don't have. and They don't. They don't. And, and I, I can't even... I can't even express the, the, I shouldn't say excitement, but the, the blessing that that grace that lives in you, because if it didn't, something like this would kill you. Yeah. But it does go back to a lot of conversations that we've had before even this, because yeah. I remember me and you've talked about buying groceries or, or paying our light bill. I, and I still do it. And, and I know you do. To oh, yeah. Literally, like if I'm living and I can pull out a checkbook, and that power bill comes, and I write that bill. And if it's 150 or 400, when I put the stamp on it, I feel proud. Now I'm frustrated. Money just left the account. Yeah. But there's a grace in that to know that my light bill will be on another month. Exactly. My lights, my refrigerator's gonna be cold. Kids, try exactly. to keep that thing not too low if it's in the summer, and don't keep it too high, uh, Christy, when it's in the winter, because I'd like to keep it about, but. There's an amazing amount. Of, I don't take that for granted. I got another month. And, I know. And I think, I think this story just goes to, to your mentality of a different level of that grace where they might take one leg, but I still got my other one. 
Yeah, and uh, I get choked up talking about friends and family so much because, uh, you know, when I told, when I told like my, you guys, and I told, you know, like, like there's been so many times like, uh, you don't ask for, you don't ask for anything in return because I want to make sure that people are happy, like I told you. But then when you do have something or you stub your toe and you get that back, you know, you get back the love and the appreciation. <laughs> that's the true wealth in life. Oh, yeah. And that's what makes it that what makes it valuable. Meaning like money, assets don't mean nothing. I told Michelle, I, the only time I've broke down on this was, well, this is number two, but the only time I've broke down, period, on this, I said, I said, there's, there's, I got so many people that I could call and I could say, come help me, and they would, and that means so much to me, <laughs> family or friends, <laughs> it means so much, not that I ever would. Not that I want to, but just to know what else, Nick. Look, dude, I need I need help doing this. I know, I know. Like that, man. There's so many people to be there. Not just you two. I'm talking no. about thousands of people. People that's gonna come and not see it. Then they'll be there the oh, same way. Oh my way. god. And that's the true meaning of wealth in life. And I hope that's the return of me living my life as a people pleaser, being positive and smiling to make feel make people feel appreciated. Dang it, Waddy. I know, golly, but you got, got me, me all. Crying. I think I think it's gas like something making my eyes water. Yeah, but I know that sounds so trivial and I don't know if I put it in the right no, words. It's, but it's it's if anything, if if it, those kind of things it's, make you think of life. Things it makes you think in life a different, a little different when something like that. So when you're laying on your deathbed, you don't think about. I see people treating other people so bad, and so mean. It bothers me so much to know that. It's like a there's a peace to know that, if I'm laying in the bed, or I'm on my last breath that I've got people that I've that I've done right by and they've done right by me and they are my they are my friends. I mean, I, I don't know why that is such a peace with me. I wish more people felt that way. I think people should yes. feel that way about how you treat somebody because at the end of the day, look how many people have croaked with all kinds of assets and all kinds of money. Oh, unbelievable. Means nothing. Nothing. Trophy, Means nothing. Trophy room. We got to be able to pay that light bill that you're talking about. We got to be able to pay that. Absolutely. I get it. But at the end of the day, <laughs> eating lunch with your buddies, having these type of relationships, know that you could call up. You know, if I really needed, if I really needed, and honestly, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, thousands of, of friends, I, I really feel like, as I would for them, not just not just a one-way street. I want people to know, and I hope that they think that I'm that type of person, that I would be there for them because I've always been wired as a people pleaser. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, through this whole thing, I've been, like you said, I, I it means more to me to comfort the people around me because I don't want y'all hurting over me. I'm okay. But I know it's it does mean so much to me to know that if I call, need some help, need some support, I got it. It's, it's it's what you it's what all you've given yeah you know you know that they're there yeah. to get back and and you know you are a consummate entertainer t bone and you're exactly right never thought of it but your profession you know when you show up you know one thing to remember if you've ever had a chance to shake t bone's hand and it's funny uh you didn't see me i got i got kind of choked up at Whitaker gun this year um because Lord, it's humidity and making my eyes water. <laughs> but uh, one thing that me, you, and Nick made a commitment to uh, 
to do through our opportunities. I said, man, we ain't never sitting down, ever, to shake a man's hand, hug a neck, ever. We, we, we're nothing, we, we ain't nothing to give, nothing. We're just some rednecks that like to hunt, shoot bows, and yelp in a turkey. But we always never stood behind a table. We'd always put ourselves out there. And, and uh, the first time I even knew what she was going through was in at, at Whitaker. And yeah. It, and, and man, it was just, I sit over there and me and Nick are standing doing our thing. But to see you sitting there, not because you was a big guy. Yeah, we would, we would, we would get through with the NWTF or that show in Pennsylvania. And, yeah. And man, be exhausted. Yeah, how can you get exhausted standing there all day just telling stories, looking oh. at trail cam pictures? But you're giving yourself because I know what it was like to go wake, walk up and shake Chuck Adams' hands. I, yep. I remember meeting some ball players. And, and 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 I knew there was no different, but I had so much respect. So the respect that somebody comes to see us, and I never forget, man, I got tore up thinking. I said, like, T-Bone does not want to be sitting there. He wants to be standing up and hugging. And so I guess I guess the message is, you know, now if anybody sees this or sees it, you know, T-Bone is here, and, and our whole crew can tell you T-Bone ain't never asked nothing from nobody. <laughs> other than maybe a good warm biscuit with a little butter in it you know and 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 obviously he's had some amazing partners that 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 has helped his livelihood but if there's one thing you can give give, give my buddy now is is prayer and just your, and just your thoughts cuz cuz we do believe it even though our life don't always reflect it uh cuz I promise you I've raised my share of hell I know you have too but but I do believe in God and Jesus and and I do believe when you Go to him in prayer. I think all things are possible. Absolutely. So I won't preach a lot, but pray for my man T-Bone. But in the process, be thinking about your own life, man. It makes me think of mine. It could be, it could be anybody at any time. Not, oh, not, yeah. I mean, so well, it happens of, all the time. And I think about it, you know, and it's funny. And I felt like our message has always been like, yeah, who, who don't want to kill big animals? I mean, I look at... You know, my wife picked out a handful of these African animals and stuck them in here because she thinks it goes with the decor. But I don't see them as decor. I'm thinking there's an adventure. That was a big, huge impala. And bless Buck, some of this stuff, I don't even know what it's called. I just shot it, you know. Uh, and I got some stuff mounted. But sometimes I, I, I see tax terms and I get a little frustrated. Um, and I know that sounds so weird and awkward. And here's why. The reason I've always even said or thought that is because of the fact that I say, this ain't nothing if I can't sit in here with friends and have some high-level philosophical conversations about family. I, I, the biggest deer I got is collecting dust. And like you said, I'm thankful like you did. This ain't what I talk to every day. I don't come in here and pet these things and look at them and take a picture and post them on the internet. It means something to me in my adventure and the people I spent time. And so if you're trying to build something, whether it's trying to put more money in your pocket, that's fine, but you can't talk to your money. And you, you can have all the money in the world if you ain't got friends to share it with. It's kind of like having a piece of chocolate cake, as Jimmy said. Jimmy John says. If you ain't got somebody to share it with, it don't taste as good. Nope. And, and, and the most unbelievable thing, if you're a hunter and you're good at it and you're spending all your money, if you're walking over your wife, you're walking over relationships, if you're walking over people, you're doing things illegal just to have one more dead animal in a trophy room, that inevitably maybe you can sit in there alone and smoke a cigar and don't nobody care because in reality, nobody does care. Nobody cares. It's sad. And, and so I think through hunting and, and hearing your story and, and your fight right now, hunting is not the animals that give us. It's not this trophy room of animals. Mm. It's these memories and this unbelievable relationships that we built that these relationships you built through these adventures, they're going to be right there. And I promise you, I ain't in shape as I once was, but if you don't think I won't take your one-legged ass and push you over my shoulder and toast you to a blind, you done lost your mind. Yeah, we're going to film that. I might have to get... <laughs> yeah, I ain't going to say I ain't going to get some of these younger guys that's a little more ambitious and strong. Yeah. But me and me and Nick and this crew, T-Bone, this is just the start of something that's a story. I do believe it's, it's something that that shows your perseverance and that, that, that I know. I've always thought, and we've always, it's funny. Yeah, I've always been the guy who's like, T-Bone, you can shoot, you can do this. Yeah. You can get up this mountain. You know, we've always, you know, it's funny. We, you know, you probably took the blunt of a lot of jokes from us and vice versa. I get a lot of 
Ribbon Nick does because we all got our own personality things. And we were raising a generation to where I, I, I ain't saying we're bullies, but it's almost like we, we bullying never bothered me because it's almost like if anything, it motivated yeah. me. You know, it's almost like, you know, I was the dumb redneck. Yeah. But I've also been the same dumb redneck to sit down with some pretty big corporate companies that I didn't have a clue what they're talking about. But at the end of it, they wrote me a check. Build scar tissue. I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't go to college. You didn't either. And but we learn and we survive and our, our stories of survival. Yep. And that's what yours would be. But what I will say is that we've always been thankful and I know you've been always amazingly thankful. And, and I think in the end, uh, this, this battle you're going through that, that you're not going through it alone, independently alone. You're going through it. What's what you're working with your body, but you got a hell of a lot of people that love you. And and I yep. think, I think we, you know, we see it every day and, and you do and appreciate it, but the, the prayer warriors, the different people that's going to be there for you, uh, and to know that you're saying it and you don't want no sympathy, like I said, if anything, uh, what you're fine with you, man, you, you, you still giving back. You still motivating us. Hey, all our crew, that, which by the way, you son of a gun, this is the hardest secret I've ever had to keep in my life. I, I, I ain't never been good at keeping I know, secrets. I, know. I can't buy Christmas in, 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 in September because I'll tell my kids yeah. you know, what Santa Claus had already dumped on my porch. I've been and gave it to them. Same with my wife. Well, it was time. I mean, it had been six months and I'd only let about 25 people know friends and family, but, um, I, you know, I just didn't want, I didn't know what we were going through. So I wanted to, you know, to try to stay focused on that and, uh, you know, not, not, not get loose focus on what was going on. I wanted to make sure that, you know, plus what you go through as far as chemo wise, I mean, they were taking me to, for, for three months there, I was basically at death's door about every day. I mean, I felt like a, a wet dish rag. I mean, I, it was horrible. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that for sympathy. I'm just saying like That's, you, you was... ain't in, you, you just, you just want to be able to exist each day. So nonetheless, we're past that. We got some clarity. We know what path we're going down and it looks like we know what's going to happen. So not out of the woods yet, but it looks like we've got a, uh, you know, a, a, a good prognosis and hopefully everything wor- works out good and it, and it's time to let folks know. So absolutely. Yeah. So and, overall <laughs> they're thinking the chemotherapy has took things and put it in check just double check to make sure the, it the nodule him. on the lung it feels pretty contained and, and to, for now and, and then and then with, with the amputation yep feel like they'll get rid of the sarcoma that's there yep and stop and get well above where it's grown yep and hopefully just next big challenge is just getting the prosthetic keep... and that's right healing up getting the prosthetic uh learning how to deal with life with just one leg and then keeping a check on all my vitals to make sure that, you know, cancer hasn't changed there. We've just got to keep a check on that, make sure that there's nothing in there. But as of all the information we have now, it looks like everything's clear except for on my leg. So we'll know a lot more after the CAT scan tomorrow and then we'll keep a check on it. But very blessed to have this, you know what I mean? I'd, yeah. I'd much rather go through life with just one leg is to not have, you know, so many people, you know, uh, you know, Jim Shockey's wife, Louise Shockey, has yeah. lung cancer right now. And, and you know, you was affected by cancer, you know, with your mom. I lost my mom in 2010. And everybody that's watching this podcast has been affected by cancer. It doesn't discriminate absolutely. whatsoever. It absolutely sucks, even though I've got a positive attitude and you do too. And, you know, we're humbled and smiling and it, it stinks. I ain't gonna lie to you. Oh. You know, I mean, it, there's been several times everybody wants to pound a pillow over uh you know some some of the things and how it's affected us but it doesn't discriminate and i feel very blessed to even though i've been through a lot not looking for sympathy not looking for a pity party i feel very blessed to it looks like i'm going to be minus a leg Mm -hmm. but nonetheless uh i'm going to be around to bug you guys and tune bows and stuff like that and share camp and you know uh, steal a biscuit off your plate for many years to come so Hopefully everything turns out just like what we think it will. Well, so, hey, yeah. part of this is for me to figure out what the path going forward. So I know you're going to kick this. I ain't, you're going to whoop the cancer part of it. So really the biggest obstacles we got, how are we going to get you to the blind, which you're going to get to the blind? Mm-hmm. Uh, how are we going to get you up the mountain, which we'll figure that part out. Don't um, worry about that. We'll, we'll, we'll figure, figure that part out. And then really the biggest obstacle we got, we just got to get with Thoroughgood and see how we auction off him right, right-footed Thoroughgood. <laughs> I know it ain't that the truth. 
I think my prosthetic will, will handle one. I think I'll still have one on there. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? Never mind. Yeah. I, never yeah, mind. I'm going to need it. Oh, well, that's what we do. Yeah. We laugh in the midst but of But remember the I told you earlier on that I could swim real good? I'll just be swimming in a circle like a one-legged duck now, huh? Think about this. <laughs> you, you, dude, you, it might make you faster. Yeah, streamline. <laughs> Well, I'm sure that'll be a lot of that. That's just the beginning of us, the way we look at life. Like I said, we ain't picking on each other. It's just, by George, what, what's that old saying? If it serves you, uh, if life serves you something, turn it into this. Or if you got, you know. Lemonade. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If it serves you lemon, make it in lemonade. Yeah. And so if there's ever somebody, if you want to see somebody make some lemonade out of it, yeah. keep your eye on Big T-Bone because yeah. I promise you, he's going to take something sour and bitter and turn it into something special and yep. so uh we got a we got a tough few months ahead of us but uh we'll 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 get it all figured out well and the next big obstacle we got right now today to is, is to go eat because yeah. i can tell you what we got to do my wife would be in here if she has been so excited about you coming down yeah so she can go eat with t-bone turner so, yeah so, so we're, we're gonna, gonna talk that. the horns off a of billy goat this may be Man, a well, I, podcast. I could spend here for all day for two days and talk but uh <laughs> But T-Bone, I love you, buddy. Love and you too, everybody man. listening loves you. And yep. uh, we, we're here. So. Yeah, I appreciate everybody's, you know, but, you know, even beforehand, thoughts and prayers. And I mean, I mean, even before this, you know, I hope it shows in our social media posts and our TV show that we're, we're so blessed and we're so appreciative of everybody out there. So it goes without saying, but we might need to crank it up just a little nod on that prayer request here and you dang right. we'll get through this and then we'll do the prayer request for the folks out there. Cause I know just like there's a lot of better hunters out there. There's a lot of people out there struggling mm -hmm. a lot worse than what I am. So that's right. Yeah. We're thinking of them. And so. I'll end it with this. If you think you're still going to come up to the celebrity shoot off at the hunting personality and win, <laughs> T-Bone's still probably going to hop up there and whoop us all. I know, <laughs> I know you too well. I love you, buddy. I love you too, man. Dang yeah. it.